What is it that you do? What is it that you do? 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse number 13, reading through verse 25, and the King James text today reads, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, <clears throat> but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble or weak are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Actually, I want to read verses 26 and 27 as well. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Amen. Let's go to the Lord once again as the Word of God is about to go forth this afternoon. Amen. Master, Savior, we love you today so very much, God. We are so grateful for salvation. We are so grateful for the Word of God. We're grateful, Lord, that you have given us this marvelous text, this supernatural text which allows faith, the substance that moves heaven and earth, to grow and to prosper and to bear fruit in our lives. For as the word of God is preached, faith is born in our hearts. The word of God declaring, now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Lord, today I am forever acknowledging that it is the word of God that has the power to change. It is the word of God that has the power to heal, to deliver, to save. And Lord, today accept the man of God or the woman of God be anointed of the Holy Ghost. Accept their soul be set on fire by the Spirit of the Almighty, the author and the finisher of our faith. 
then Lord, the word of God is without benefit. It's useless. We do not need to hear from me today. We need to hear from the author. We need to hear today God from the one who wrote the words, not merely the one who reads the words. I ask, Lord, that you would anoint my feeble lips, that you would anoint my body, my mind, my spirit today. Help me to instruct the people of God in the way of righteousness. Help your word today to accomplish in the hearing of those that would hear both live, those that will hear later by reason of the internet. Allow the word of God to accomplish inspiration. Allow it, O oh God, today to accomplish liberation. Allow it, God, today to be sent forth from heaven that it might heal those who are sick in body. It might reclaim those who are backslidden. It might save those who are lost. O oh Master, today touch every hearer. Allow us today, O oh God, to have a desire deep in our spirit not only to hear the words that are spoken, but to receive those words as though they were the bread of life. For today, O oh God, it is in fact the bread of life. We ask all this in none other than the precious name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. I don't know about y'all, but I grew up in the Pentecostal movement. My whole life, I have been accustomed to preachers getting in the pulpit one after another. Pastors, evangelists, teachers. And every one of them in reading the Word of God has come up with some new requirement as to what and how a child of God should behave and how they should conduct themselves and what practices they ought to commit themselves to. Why, one Sunday you'll hear the pastor preach that every child of God should be on their knees in the morning praying and seeking the face of God before they begin their day. And then on Wednesday night, you'll hear another say that every evening, every child of God should kneel at their bedside and seek the face of the Lord before they lay their head down to sleep. And then it comes time for revival and the evangelist comes through. And the evangelist says, Daniel is said to have prayed three times a day with his face looking out the window toward the east. All oh, children of God, we too want to commit ourselves to praying three times a day. And it just seems like there is a never-ending flood of requirements and necessities. We have people constantly defining for us what a child of God should do and how they should do it. Why? Because religion is always trying to mandate. Religion is always trying to place requirements upon the church. It seeks to suggest that all believers should have the same spiritual convictions, the same practices, and the same habits. I don't know how many sermons I've heard growing up in the church that suggested all Christians should begin their day with prayer, end their day with prayer, so on and so forth. I've heard it preached Christians should pray at least 30 minutes a day. Or I've heard it preached Christians should pray at least one hour a day. Believers should go to church at least three times a week or twice a week. Every time you turn around, there's another preacher with another mandate or another requirement. But the truth today of Christian living is not wrapped up in one neat and tidy package meant 
for all God's people to aspire to. <clears throat> but rather it is in the reality that each believer must find that walk with God which works for them and maximizes their potential as a member of the body of Christ. I've had people in this church, we've had members in this church, who seem to think that members of the body could not act independently, they could not do what they felt needed to be done and what they felt they should do, but rather they felt that the pastor should be mandated. Why doesn't the pastor call more prayer meetings? Why doesn't the pastor have more church services? Why doesn't the pastor do this? Why doesn't the pastor do that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I have always believed in body ministry. As many years as I've been in ministry, I have always believed in body ministry. What is body ministry? Body ministry means that every single member of the church, every person in the church, has some form of ministry. They have some duty, some responsibility that falls upon them. That that is their function. That is their calling. And it's not necessarily that you only have one. You may have dozens of uh, things that God has put in your life uh, that you are to do as part of the church. For instance, let me give you an example. Again, I've used this example in the past as well. I have been part of churches over the course of my life that I was not the worship leader in. I was a member. I was in the pew. I was not at the front of the sanctuary leading the worship service. I was not leading the song service. I was in the pew. But I understood that I had an obligation and a responsibility before church to get on my knees at the altar and to get on my knees at the seat. Uh, at the front of the sanctuary and begin to pray and seek the Lord and, and try to pray down the power of God before the church service ever began. I was in one church in southern New England many years ago and when I first attended this church it was a small new work. When I first attended this church I noticed that all the people in this particular congregation would be talking and chatting and fellowshipping before the service. But I knew, Tommy, in my own spirit and in my own heart, that that's not how a Pentecostal church is supposed to conduct itself. We believe so powerfully in prayer. We believe prayer is the engine that drives the church. It brings down the power of God. It unleashes the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Little church I grew up in, we used to have a prayer room to one side of our uh, platform in the sanctuary. And that little prayer room would be full. If church started at 7 o'clock, that little prayer room would be full by 6, 6.30 at least with many people from our church, many of those great, wonderful, godly, dedicated saints of God. They'd get in that prayer room and they'd be praying before church ever started. The prayer room would get so full up you couldn't get in there. People would be out in the altars praying before church ever got started. The altars would get filled up. People would be at their seats praying before church ever got started. See, we're not, 
Catholic. We don't just get on our knee and cross ourselves as we enter the pew. No, we go to God before church ever begins because we know, hey, I've been fighting a lot of devils this week. I've been out there in the world. I've been discouraged. I've been despondent. I've been put down. I've been uh, going through trials and tribulations and struggles. I need to get into a frame of mind where I can hear from God. I need to get into a frame of mind where I can touch the Lord. Somebody may come into this church today that needs to be saved. And I need to be in a frame of mind where I can help pray them through. Somebody may come into this place today who needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I need to be in a place where I can pray them through to the Holy Ghost. Somebody may come in today. And they're sick in body. They're dying. And they need a miracle. They need a healing. I need to be in a frame of mind where I can touch God on their behalf. I need to put some preparation time in. It's not about just walking into the church and starting to sing the songs and praying a little prayer at the start of the service. Honey, by the time you get to the opening prayer, God's people, and I've said this so many times, it it drives me up the wall. God's people should have already been in the sanctuary. They should have already been praying. They should have already touched the Lord. That opening prayer should be so anointed of the Holy Ghost that people are shouting before you finish. That's how it used to be at the Riverside Church of God. People be in the altars praying before church. By the time Brother Gillum got up to start the service with a word of prayer, the Holy Ghost would fall while he was praying the opening prayer. I'm not kidding. Serious as a heart attack. He'd be praying the opening prayer and the Spirit of the Lord begin to fall. People begin to leap to their feet and shout and dance and rejoice in the Holy Ghost. I remember a little black church in Brooklyn, New York that I used to love to visit. The pastor's name was Dobbins. And all I'm going to tell you, he was in a rough part of town. You'd hear gunshots from his sanctuary. It was a rough part of town. Never scared me. I went there to visit as often as I could. And I'll tell you why. Because those people understood the value of praying before church. And I mean, they would be, they'd fill that place. If church started at 7, they'd be in there at 5 o'clock, 5.30 praying. And I mean, you walk in that sanctuary before church and you could feel the presence of God. The anointing of the Holy Ghost was palpable. You could literally feel it. It was like you were walking through a waterfall. And I'm going to tell you, the first note on that piano, when they started their worship service, the first note that that pianist would hit, the Holy Ghost would fall. I saw it happen over and over. It was the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. Now, there are a lot of churches that their whole worship service is based on hype. Their whole worship service is based on working people up into a frenzy and getting people all worked up. But you know what? That pianist would hit the first note on that piano and the Holy Ghost would fall on that place. I'm not kidding. It was the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. They'd start singing the songs of Zion and all of a sudden, I mean to tell you, them people start worshiping God, they'd be damned. I mean, they were in the spirit. They weren't just jigging because they wanted to jig. They were dancing in the Holy Ghost. They were shouting. Oh my God, they were giving God the glory. It was the most wonderful thing I'd ever seen. I never saw a church that was so committed to praying down the power of God. Now, I said all that to say this. I was part of this church in southern New England. I know how things are supposed to be done in a Pentecostal church, but the people weren't doing it. Now, I have an option. I can either follow their lead, or I can understand my place in the body. And I can understand that, no, my job then is to set an example and to do what ought to be done. So while they were talking and chatting and fellowshipping before church, I went down to the front of the sanctuary. I got on my knees and I began to pray. Well, 
At first, I'd be praying, and I mean, I thought you'd hear the hum of people talking and chatting before church, you know. And it was kind of hard to pray because all these people yakking and talking. But do you know, Tommy, it only took about three or four weeks, literally. That's all it took. And all of a sudden, more and more people begin to come down and do what I was doing. I noticed in the worship services that people were so stoic and so they were not allowing the, the Spirit of God to move on them. and They were not striving to worship in the Spirit. See, to worship in the Spirit, you've got to get your mind and your heart and your spirit out of this world and focused on Jesus. And the Lord has got to be the only thing you see in your in your mind side, the only thing you see in your spirit. You're not worried about your neighbor. You're not worried about people standing around you. And what your spirit feels, what's happening in your spirit, you just surrender to that and you begin to allow it to manifest itself. And I mean, if the Spirit of the Lord, if the Holy Ghost touches you, and all of a sudden you feel victory in your soul, and you feel like dancing and shouting, then you just begin to dance and shout. Hallelujah. But see, when you do it in response to the move of the Holy Ghost in your spirit... That's what we call dancing in the Spirit. That's what we call shouting in the Spirit. That's what we call uh, speaking in the Holy Ghost, speaking in the Spirit, speaking in tongues as motivated by the Holy Ghost. A lot of people do these things just to be doing these things. You go to a lot of churches and you'll see people. Oh, they get out there and they start to do their little jig and they start to do their little dance. They're no more in the Spirit than I am. They're not in the Spirit. No, I'm going to tell you, when you see somebody in the Spirit, you know they're in the Spirit. There is such a distinct difference between somebody operating in the flesh and somebody operating in the Spirit. When you see them in the Spirit, you see that they literally are lost in what they're doing. They're, they're not even aware. They're not even paying attention. Whatever's happening with their body... It's a manifestation of what's happening in their spirit. And Tommy, they're not focused on what's happening in their body. They're focused on what's happening in their spirit. They're celebrating. I've had the Holy Ghost hit me, and I've done things in the spirit that I didn't even know I did. Had people tell me, oh, brother, you ran past me in the altar today. I was praying for this lady. She was seeking the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, I was singing a special in the, in the church. I was on the platform singing a special with Sister Bruce. And they said, all of a sudden, you leaped off the platform. You come running around the outside of the sanctuary. You ran around the outside of the pews. And you came flying past us. I was praying with this girl in the altar for the Holy Ghost. And Sister Julie Maston told me, she said, in my hair, I literally felt my hair fly like wind blew over me when you ran past me. She said, I swear it was like God, there was a wind behind you. She said, it was the most amazing thing. She said, all of a sudden, that young woman threw her hands up in the air, started speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. She received the Holy Ghost. See, when you begin to obey and you begin to get in the Spirit and out of the flesh, I'm going to tell you what happens. It literally begins to boil over in the congregation and others begin to feel that liberation. They begin to feel the shackles broken off of them. And all of a sudden it, it begins to, to spread. Others begin to find themselves getting in the spirit. But in order for that to happen, you got to have one who's willing to ignore everything and not worry about nothing and just worship God and let the Spirit flow. Well, in this same church that I began praying before church, they had the most dry, dead, abysmal worship services I'd ever been in in my life. Whew. When I first went there, I said, Dear God, have mercy. Nobody in this church, they don't even know what it is. 
to get in the Spirit. They don't even know what it is to worship in the Spirit. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, well, then that's your job. I said, what's my job? He said, you teach them. I said, Lord, I was only about 18 at the time. I said, Lord, I'm not a teacher in this church. He said, you don't have to be. What you have to be is an example. Same way you got down and prayed. You set an example and others followed your example. He said, you need to worship and just let me move. And don't worry about what they're doing or what they're not doing. I said, all right, Lord. All of a sudden, Tommy, I come down, I pray before church. When the worship service started, everybody else is standing there clapping like this, you know, like they're half constipated. Everybody else is not putting any energy into their worship. They're not. But see, the Word of God teaches that we're to worship God with all our might, with all our energy. We're supposed to worship God with our emotion, with our heart. We're supposed to put effort into worshiping God. Why? Because God is not a fiction to us. God is real. And if God is real, then why do we worship Him with less energy, less enthusiasm than we display when we go to a football game if God's real to us so the church service started we started singing and I closed my eyes and I said Lord we singing I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. And I'm just belting it out. I grew up in church. They always taught us when I was a kid, when you come to church, the Word of God said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. The Word of God said, make a loud noise. So you don't sing under your breath. You sing with all your might. So while everybody else says, I'll fly away, oh God. I'm sitting there. I'll fly away, oh glory. Doesn't matter if I'm in tune, out of tune. Doesn't matter if my voice is good or bad. I'm singing with all my might. And I begin to sing. All of a sudden, I'm finding myself getting in the Holy Ghost. I'm finding myself getting in the Spirit. Next thing you know, I've got a dance in my step. And I'm dancing across the front of that sanctuary. And I'm shouting and I'm worshiping God. And I'm having the time of my life. All of a sudden, I wasn't even aware of how dead and dry and abysmal their worship services were. Why? Because instead of participating in their worship service, I was doing what I knew I was supposed to do. I was worshiping God the way I knew the Word of God teaches to worship Him. And my Bible said, God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him. Not should, not could, not can, but must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's got to get past your lips. It's got to get past your mind. It's got to get into your spirit. And when it gets into your spirit, your spirit begins to do things that in your flesh you might not feel comfortable doing. But you know what? If you get in the spirit, all of a sudden the flesh becomes less important. You don't care what the flesh feels comfortable doing or not. Oh, brother, I'd be so embarrassed to dance in church. I'd be so embarrassed to dance in the Spirit. No, you wouldn't, honey. You learn to get in the Spirit. And let me tell you a little secret. You ain't going to be worried about it in the least. You're not going to be worried about it at all. It ain't even, it ain't even going to cross your mind. You're going to just find yourself, literally, your spirit will be mandating how you worship God. Not your mind, not your flesh, your spirit. And it's the Holy Ghost that is inspiring your spirit. Because God is the spirit. The spirit does not communicate with your flesh. God's spirit does not communicate with your flesh. God's spirit communicates with your spirit. Next thing you know, months passed, the pastor came to me and he said, Brother Chuck, I've got to thank you. I've got to express my appreciation to you. He said, when you came into this church, he said, I knew there were things that 
we weren't doing right. I knew there were things uh, that, that things weren't going as they ought to go in a Pentecostal church. He said, but son, man, you set an example for the people of God. He said, you literally have transformed our church. Thanks to you, the people of God now begin every service in prayer like they ought to. Thanks to you, the people of God are now worshiping in the Spirit. They're getting out of the flesh, he said. And it's all because you set the example. You see, every member of the body is not the same. Every member of the body, we're told in our primary text today, has a different function, has a different duty, or a different job. The problem is too many in the church today don't know what their job is. Too many in the church, I want to be a Sunday school teacher. I want to teach on Wednesday night. I want to preach. I want to do this. I want to do that. Everybody wants to be up front. Everybody wants to be in the spotlight, as it were. When some of the most important work of the church doesn't require you be in the spotlight, some of the most important work in the church needs to be done from the pew. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I could not have helped that church as a worship leader the way that I was able to help that church as an example in worship. Because when you're leading worship, you have to be more mindful. You, you've got to be more attentive to what you're doing because you're the worship leader. So I couldn't have done what I did, Tommy, if I were the worship leader. No, I could only do it from my pew. I could only do it from my seat. But I knew what my job was, and I did it. Too many members of the body today don't understand what it is that they do. My question to you this afternoon is, what is it that you do? Not all believers today are prayer warriors. Not all believers today are worship leaders or even worship influencers. Some people are too timid. Some people haven't yet attain the skills or the ability to get in the Spirit and to worship God in the Spirit. See, I'm going to tell you, that's part of growing spiritually. You learn how to get in the Spirit as you mature in the Holy Ghost. That's not something you necessarily know the minute you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, how to get in the Spirit. But John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. He was not in a good place. He was not in a good frame of mind. He was not in a good circumstance. And yet John said, I was on the Isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, the Lord's Day came. And what did I do on the Lord's Day? He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Hallelujah. What did he mean? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. A lot of churches, you just go to church. John didn't say I was in prayer. He didn't say I was in church. He didn't say I was worshiping or I was singing. He said I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What was John saying? John was saying, I had focused on Jesus. I've gotten my circumstance and my situation out of my mind and out of my eyesight. And I was in the Spirit. The Spirit of God and my Spirit were communing one with the other. He might have been doing some shouting. I do a lot of shouting at home. He might have done. To, he might have been praying in the Holy Ghost. I do a lot of praying in the Holy Ghost at home. He might have been dancing in the Spirit. I don't know. I do a lot of dancing in the Spirit at home. Well, I'll tell you, the only time you can get in the Spirit is when you're in church. There's something wrong with your walk with God. We've had 
people in our church over the years who claim to have come from Pentecostal background. Oh, I was born and raised in the Pentecostal movement. I've had the Holy Ghost since I was a kid. Oh, I've had people brag to me about how wonderful it was that they've been in the movement all these years and how they've had the Holy Ghost. And I was excited when they first came, Tommy, because our ministry has brought a lot of people in over the years who have never been part of a Pentecostal church. So I'm literally having to teach people over and over again from the ground up. I'm having to bring people who, who have never even been in a Pentecostal church. We've had people from Lutheran and Catholic and Baptist and Presbyterian and Episcopalian. You name it, we've had them. And I'm having to try to teach them uh, the things of God from the word go. And of course there are people dealing with LGBT discrimination, people live on, uh, dealing with LGBT oppression and uh, isolation, and you know, there's so many issues. So I'm having to teach them from the ground up. And when I get somebody coming to their church bragging to me about how they've got the Holy Ghost and how they've been in the church all these years, I'm excited. Oh, I'm thrilled out of my mind. I said, oh, praise God. Finally, somebody who's going to know how to worship in the Spirit. Finally, somebody who's going to know how to pray before church starts the way you ought to pray. Somebody who can set the example in worship and set the example in prayer. They never do either of those things. Finally, somebody who knows how to get in the Spirit and follow the leading of the Lord. If they feel led in the middle of preaching to come down to the altar and begin to seek God, they know that in a Pentecostal church, you do that. If God lays on your heart to get up and come down to the altar and start praying while I'm still preaching, then you do that because God knows there might be something he's wanting to do. There may be somebody demon-possessed in that congregation. There may be somebody sick in that congregation who needs a touch from God. And what God's trying to do is he's, he's laid on your heart he's laid on your spirit you need to get in the altar and pray because you've got to prepare yourself for what you're about to help me do or what I'm about to help you do and so they understand oh praise God they understand how to obey the Holy Ghost how to obey the Spirit of the Lord how to be in the Spirit and one of the things that I most looked forward to was having somebody that I could be here in my home with and we could be talking and we both would be able to just allow the Holy Ghost to move. See, I've been in conversations with people who are Holy Ghost filled, who know how to get in the Spirit, who know how to be in the Spirit and the Holy Ghost has just fallen on us. And next thing you know, we're on our knees praying in the middle of the living room, having us a four-hour prayer meeting. And neither one of us ever looked at one another and said, how about we pray? No, because we're people who are Holy Ghost filled, who understand the move of God. And we might be talking about something. And because we're both able to hear from the Spirit of God, we're both able to submit and surrender and yield to the leading of the Holy Ghost. It just simultaneously happens. I've had people in the church tell me I was so excited to have because I thought I had somebody I'd be able to experience that with. Years ago when I attended one Pentecostal church in East Texas, there was a sister in the church, Sister Chambers. You've heard me talk about her. She was in her 80s. I used to drive school bus every afternoon while I was waiting for the next, or every morning after my morning run, before my afternoon run. She lived near the bus lot, so I'd go spend the, the day with her a lot of days. Loved her. She was such a marvelous Holy Ghost filled lady. I'm going to tell you, that lady was amazing. I wish to heavens I could have written her book because uh, the testimony she had, the stories she could tell were amazing. But she and I would be sitting in her living room talking, 
and pray, and we'd just be talking about the Lord, talking about the Word of God. All of a sudden, we'd get to talking in tongues and praying in the Holy Ghost. Next thing you know, we'd be on our knees having a prayer meeting. We'd be up on our feet shouting and dancing. It was all just because we were two people who were from the same place in our walk with God. We both knew how to let the Spirit of God. You can let the Spirit of God move, and if you're a child of God full of the Holy Ghost and know how this thing works, then you understand the minute you begin to lift up the name of Jesus, the Word of God said, we're two or more gathered together in my name. What? There I am in the midst of them. You don't have to have church to have the presence of God. You don't have to have church going on to have a move of God or to have the Holy Ghost fall on you. And I had people in the church I was so excited to have. And you know what? Not one time, not one time did we ever have that. There were times I'd be talking to some of these people and I'd be sharing something, I'd be sharing my burden, I'd be sharing my heart. All of a sudden, I'd begin to feel the Holy Ghost moving in me. Ooh, my spirit would start to get happy. I'd get to speaking in tongues. I'd get to praying in the Holy Ghost. And if I were with anybody else, we'd have had us a Holy Ghost outbreak right then. And that fool sat there looking at me like this. I got so disappointed and discouraged I couldn't see straight. I thought I had somebody who actually could help me carry my burden. I thought I had somebody who could actually help me pray some things through. I thought I had somebody who could help set an example for the people of God. None of those things proved to be true. Oh, this person wanted to teach. Every time I had camp meeting, this person wanted to teach. This person wanted to do this or wanted to do that. But we're all members of the body. Not all members of the body are exposed to the air. A lot of our body is covered by clothes. You can't see it. I got news for you. A lot of members of the body are not in the spotlight. A lot of members of the body don't get on the platform. A lot of members on the body aren't going to wind up on the video. Hello now. No, but their function is every bit as important as any other. Am I telling the truth today? The importance today is understanding what your job is. What God wants to use you to accomplish in the church. Don't worry about what you want. What you want doesn't matter a hill of beans. What God wants is what's important. It's the will of God that we're supposed to be seeking. There are people in the church that God has placed there specifically to finance the work of God. There are people in the church that God has literally placed there because their function and their calling is to provide the resources for that church to exist and for that ministry to exist and for that ministry to do the work that it is doing. Without that person there, that work could not continue. I've talked for years about Claude. I know now, after all these years, and Claude has said this to me on many occasions, he said, did you ever think that God put me in your life and in your ministry for this very purpose? Did you ever think that? See, I never would have thought that back in the beginning when I first met him. But now as I look back, I'm like, yes, Lord. You knew exactly what you were doing. Amen. God knows how to put the erector set together. He knows how to construct the body so that everything functions as it ought to function. Am I telling the truth? There are people under the sound of my voice today. And part of your calling is to support this work. Not just financially, They're, your calling may be to support this work in prayer. Part of your calling may be to support this work by participating online and being part of our services. You see, there are a lot of things that people just don't see the value in. 
that are so important. I'm going to tell you, when I go online and I see that so many people are watching our service live or so many people have watched our videos, it encourages me. And it helps me to feel like what we're doing is worthwhile. And the effort that I put in, I get in this pulpit a lot of times, I'm sick as a mule. I've gotten in this pulpit literally days after having major surgery, haven't I? Mm -hmm. It's nice to know that all the effort I'm putting in, all the sacrifice that I'm making is worthwhile and when I see people are watching when I see people are participating online when I see that people are looking at our videos that helps to encourage me you say but pastor if that's all I'm doing it's not worth a whole lot of anything honey don't you be the little toe trying to tell the body that you don't serve an important function believe it or not that little function you're serving is a whole lot more important than you'll ever know there are parts of our body, according to our primary text today, that we don't honor much. We don't think much about them. We don't really give them a lot of credit. I have a cousin by marriage who years ago uh, was working in a company, and he was out uh, looking at a factory or in a warehouse, something that was part of the company he worked for. He was not working in that area, but he was doing some kind of a... Uh, you know, not investigation, but a uh, inspection. inspection. And all of a sudden, this huge crate thing that they were lifting fell, and it fell on his foot. He wound up having to have two or three, I think it was three toes amputated from one of his feet. Johnny had to go through months and months of rehabilitation to learn how to walk again. Because without those toes, he could not balance. He, he literally could not balance. He couldn't even stand on his feet. You would think, oh, well, you lose a couple toes. You just get up and, you know, you'll, you'll automatically compensate. Oh, no, you won't. Those toes that you don't think a whole lot about, that you don't think are very important, are way more important than you realize. They help us to maintain balance. They help us to maintain control. They help us to stand. They help us to walk. They help us to run. Those little toes that nobody ever sees, those little toes that people just don't think are all that important, are far more important than you'll ever realize. What is it that you do? What is your function in the body? Say, Pastor, my function, it, it's not that important a function. You don't know whether your, your function is important or not. It's not up to you to know. It's not up to you to second guess. It's not up to you to try to figure out. If that's what you feel like God has called you to do, if that's what you feel like God has laid on your heart to do, whatever it may be, then that's what you need to do. I have family members who for many, 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 many years, many, many, many years participated in their church's nursing home ministries. They would go to the nursing homes and they would play their guitar and sing in the nursing homes because they felt like that was their calling. Whenever someone was in a hospital sick, whenever someone was in a nursing home recuperating uh, from some illness or some difficulty. This aunt and this uncle made it their business to go to that place and visit that individual. That was their ministry. That was their function. And they performed their function regularly. They performed their function with conviction. They did this all the time. If no one else from the church went and visited the sick, they did. If no one else from the church went and visited the shut-ins, they did. If no one else went to the nursing home and sang and uh, tried to inspire the folks in the nursing home during the nursing home services, they did. There are any number of ministries and benefits that each child of God brings to the church as a collective body. Some are nurturers, while others are encouragers. 
Some are packers. Others work the front lines. Some provide the necessary support for the church to offer ministries like soup kitchens, food banks, or homeless outreaches, while others are the hands and feet that physically provide these services. The church cannot accomplish its mission if all are to be volunteers for the work and no one is available to provide the financing for that work. While many cannot seem to pray unless the whole body of the church is praying, others can devote hours to prayer whether anyone else is present to pray or not. It's always been the focus of my ministry to encourage members of the body of Christ to find their place, to identify their job, and then to excel at doing that job. The army, Tommy, has not only footmen, it does not have only marksmen, but it also has cooks. Without the cooks to feed the troops, the men on the front line could not do what they need to do and do it well. For the infantry to perform at its best, even the kitchen staff must perform at its best. Some believe they must influence the entire church to do what they feel the need or the desire to do. But in reality, they simply need to do it. The church has far too many followers and far too few doers. You feel the need for a prayer meeting? Start one! Talk to the pastor about it and then organize one. If the pastor is not able to be there for the prayer meeting, he may well give you the go-ahead and say, Brother, here's the key to the church. Set it up. We'll let the members know on Tuesday night, whatever the, the, the uh, night might be, uh, get in the church and pray. You do not need the pastor to initiate or oversee everything. You need to do what God has laid on your heart to do. No society exists or has ever existed which consists of warriors alone. No society has ever existed which consisted of hunters alone or farmers alone. Every grouping of people requires that each member of that group identify their strengths and abilities, and then maximize those abilities to benefit the group as a whole. Too many believers want only to travel in packs. If everyone else is not doing it, then somehow they cannot do it. In Romans 12, 4 through 8, the Word of God said, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of, our, of faith, or ministry let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exor exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. You know, the sad part is, if you could ask believers in many churches today the question, what is it that you do? And if they were to answer truthfully, they would say, I discourage others. Am I telling the truth? Do you know people in churches you've been part of that it seemed like that was their job because, boy, how they, they did it consistently and they did it well. Hello now. I sow division. I spread gossip. I sit in judgment and criticize. Think about it for a moment. Do you know people in churches you've been a part of 
and they do those things and my god they do it regularly and they do it very well it's not benefiting the church it's hurting the church i know people in churches i've been part of who literally chased newly born again people right out of the church over and over and over and over and over and over again you talk about having a job and doing it well these people were so gifted at it it wasn't even funny and the pastor was so weak and miserable that he didn't understand his job and call that foolishness to a halt i've known people in the church that gossiped I had one lady in my first church years ago, well, many years ago, 35 years ago to be exact. She was a terrible gossip. Gossip was something she engaged in all the time. One day I was talking to her on the phone and I said, Sister, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to talk with you and your husband after church Sunday. Uh, I need to talk to you about something. And she said, well, what is it? And I said, oh, no, 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 I don't want to talk on the phone. You know, I didn't want to talk on the phone. I said, I don't want to talk with you about it on the phone. I said, don't worry about it. I said, I just need to talk to you about it. I wasn't going to rip her, you know, I wasn't going to tear her up, but I was going to let her know. We need to call, we need to squelch this. Long story short, she kept egging me and egging me and egging me. And anybody who knows me knows after a while, you egg me enough, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. So finally I said, okay. I said, well... We've got a little problem with gossip in our church, I said, and quite frankly, you're the center of it. And there are a number of people in the church who are getting so discouraged and so upset about it that they're literally talking about quitting our church because of all the gossip. I said, well, this needs to stop. Oh boy, she read me the riot act. Well, to hell with you and your church then. I'll just go somewhere else and I'll take my tithe with me, she said. I said, okay, God bless you. Have a good day. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Preachers that struggle to keep people that are no good for their church in their church are fools. And there are a lot of pastors that do this. A lot of pastors are more worried about keeping their numbers up than they are about keeping the spiritual health of their congregation up. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. This pastor is not one of them. If I've got somebody in the church hurting things more than they're helping things, then they are free to go somewhere else. And you will not see me waste one minute's breath trying to keep them in this church. Long story short, a man began coming to church the very next Sunday. The very Sunday that she quit coming, a new man named Stan began to attend our church that next Sunday. He played piano. He played the keyboards. He tithed $20 a week more than she did. And her tithe was very, very healthy. And he tithed $20 a week. This is back, folks, in 1985 or so. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you tell me what God can and cannot do. Don't, me, don't you tell me. But you see, we've got people who do the wrong things. And my God, if they don't do it faithfully. My God, if they don't do it well. And we've got people in the church who are called to do the right things. And they don't do it at all. Life experience informs, I'm trying to call it to a close because I've gone my hour. Life experience informs us in our lives. I grew up in an environment where there was no encouragement. There, there was precious little encouragement. My grandmother, bless her heart, she was always worried about keeping you humble. She never wanted to say anything good or positive or encouraging because she was afraid it would make you proud and puffed up. I remember telling her after I became an adult and I was pestering, I said, Grandma, that's not your job. 
It's the job of every individual to humble themselves. The Bible said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. It doesn't say that the other church members need to humble you. You need to humble yourself. I said, your job is to encourage people. Your job is to give them a boost of confidence and help them. I said, it's not your job to refrain from speaking positive words and speaking encouragement. That's not your job. What in the world to make you think? God wanted you to do that. And she was this way with her children. She was this way with everybody. So I grew up in an environment where you were constantly being discouraged and constantly feeling, you know, terrible about yourself and terrible about everything you tried to do. So Tommy can tell you, I love to encourage people. Why? Because my life informed me how much that's necessary, how much that's needed. I believe in complimenting people. I believe in encouraging people. So what do I do? I'll be in a grocery store and a lady be wearing a dress. She may be the ugliest buck tooth lady with claws for feet that you've ever laid eyes on. But if I can find something worthy of a compliment, I'm going to pay a compliment to her. And I'll say, oh, that's the pretty, I love the color of your dress. Why, thank you. I'm very kind of you. <laughs> Don't I do it? I compliment. Why? Because I believe there's a need in our world for positivity. I believe there's a need in our world to sow positivity into the atmosphere. Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, everything you listen to is there to discourage you and cause you to become despondent. So somebody has to sow positivity into the atmosphere. And I've literally made that my mission in life to do that. I believe in encouraging people. So what do I do? I spent days and days and days, not a day, not an hour. I spent several days and many, many, many hours online, I mean on my computer, creating memes. These memes cover everything from the death of a loved one to a birthday, to people being sick, you know, get well memes, uh, feel better memes. I've created memes to congratulate people on accomplishments and anniversaries. Uh, you know, I've created memes when a person loses a pet because I know how hard it is to lose a pet. And I literally created hundreds of memes over the course of many, many days. I spent many, many, many hours doing this. Every one of them has my name at the bottom, Pastor Charles Burnett Morrow. And when I'm online and I'm on Facebook and I see somebody going through a hard time, I've got a meme I created to encourage them and I'll post that meme. I'm online and somebody's sick, I've got a meme that says, get well soon. Or hope you feel better soon because maybe they hurt themselves or, you know. I've got a meme for people who've lost pets. I've got memes for people who've lost love. Why do I do this? I'll tell you why I do this. Because I feel like if I've got a job, if God's laid on my heart something to do, then I ought to do it well. Hello now. If you're going to do something, you ought to do it consistently and you ought to do it well. Don't just do it when it happens across your mind. Put some effort into it. Put some thought into it. Amen. Make a concerted effort to do what you feel your job, your calling is. In Romans chapter 16, 17, and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So if you have somebody who seems to think it's their job to contradict the pastor, if you think, if there's somebody in the church who thinks it's their job to introduce division and to introduce strife and to bring negative things in, honey, that person becomes anathema to me. They may talk to others in the church. They're not going to get on my ear. I'm not even going to give them time. I'm not even going to let them 
have my ear. I'm not interested in that foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. We're a body. Not only do we need to do our job, not only do we need to do it consistently and do it well, but we need to be working in cooperation with the rest of the body. We can't be so in division. We can't be so in strife. We can't be so in doubt. We can't be second-guessing the pastor. Hello now. I'm going to tell you, uh, I've had people do that to me, and I hate to say what I'm about to say. I don't say it with glee, but I'm reaping what I've sown. I'm being honest because there have been times in my life when I thought I knew better than the pastor and I sat there and second guessed the pastor. I had one pastor as a kid that I got back in contact with many years later as an adult and I sent him a message and I said, I just want to apologize to you for criticizing you as often as I did and sitting in judgment of you as I did. I said, I, I had no business doing that. I, I'll never forget, it was Brother Harmon. And I was pastoring my first church and I sent him a message. And, or no, I didn't, I called him now that I think about it, and I called him. Somehow or another, I got his number. I think I got it through Julia. And uh, she and her husband used to go down and visit him in the new church he was pastoring because he had left the church I grew up in, and he was pastoring in New Jersey. And I called him, and Brother Harmon said to me, Chuck, he said, you never did that. I don't remember you ever doing that. I said, no, because I never did it in front of your face. I did it behind your back. I said, but the word of God said you reap what you sow. I said, and I'm pastoring now, and the last thing in the world I want is to reap what I've sown. I want to repent of it. Amen. I went to him and told him, I'm sorry for having done this to you. Lastly today, and I am closing, I know this message is a little long, but this is an important word from God today. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is it that you do? What is it that you do? What is God? placed on your heart to do. There, you may have one job, you may have dozens. You know, it's, a person can do a lot of little jobs and others can do one big job. You know what I'm saying? But whatever God is, whether God's called you to be a prayer warrior, whether God's called you to be an encourager, whether God's called you uh, to be a, a visitor of the shut-in, whether God's called you uh, to be a, a special singer, whether the Lord's called you today uh, to uh, uh, engage in nursing home ministry or prison ministry, whatever the case might be. What is it that you do? And if you are called to do something, if that's your function within the body, then do it consistently and do it well. Because the body can only function well when every member is doing their job, doing its job, and doing it consistently, and doing it well. What is it that you do? Would you stand with me this afternoon?
needed. I believe in complimenting people. I believe in encouraging people. So what do I do? I'll be in a grocery store and a lady be wearing a dress. She may be the ugliest buck tooth lady with claws for feet that you've ever laid eyes on. But if I can find something worthy of a compliment, I'm going to pay a compliment to her. I'll say, oh, that's the pretty, I love the color of your dress. Why, well, thank you. I'm very kind of you. <laughs> Don't I do it? I compliment. Why? Because I believe there's a need in our world for positivity. I believe there's a need in our world to sow positivity into the atmosphere. Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, everything you listen to is there to discourage you and cause you to become despondent. So somebody has to sow positivity into the atmosphere. And I've literally made that my mission in life to do that. I believe in encouraging people. So what do I do? I spent days and days and days, not a day, not an hour. I spent several days and many, many, many hours online, I mean on my computer, creating memes. These memes cover everything from the death of a loved one to a birthday, to people being sick, you know, get well memes, uh, feel better memes. I've created memes to congratulate people on accomplishments and anniversaries. Uh, you know, I've created memes when the person loses a pet because I know how hard it is to lose a pet. And I literally created hundreds of memes over the course of many, many days. I spent many, many, many hours doing this. Every one of them has my name at the bottom, Pastor Charles Burnett Morrow. And when I'm online and I'm on Facebook and I see somebody going through a hard time, I've got a meme I created to encourage them and I'll post that meme. I'm online and somebody's sick, I've got a meme that says, get well soon. Or hope you feel better soon because maybe they hurt themselves or, you know. I've got a meme for people who've lost pets. I've got memes for people who've lost love. Why do I do this? I'll tell you why I do this. Because I feel like if I've got a job, if God's laid on my heart something to do, then I ought to do it well. Hello now. If you're going to do something, you ought to do it consistently and you ought to do it well. Don't just do it when it happens across your mind. Put some effort into it. Put some thought into it. Amen. Make a concerted effort to do what you feel your job, your calling is. In Romans chapter 16, 17, and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So if you have somebody who seems to think it's their job to contradict the pastor, if you think, if there's somebody in the church who thinks it's their job to introduce division and to introduce strife and to bring negative things into, honey, that person becomes anathema to me. They may talk to others in the church. They're not going to get on my ear. I'm not even going to give them time. I'm not even going to let them have my ear. I'm not interested in that foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. We're a body. Not only do we need to do our job, not only do we need to do it consistently and do it well, but we need to be working in cooperation with the rest of the body. 
We can't be so in division. We can't be so in strife. We can't be so in doubt. We can't be second guessing the pastor. Hello now. I'm going to tell you. Uh, I've had people do that to me and I hate to say what I'm about to say. I don't say it with glee, but I'm reaping what I've sown. <coughs> I'm being honest. Because there have been times in my life when I thought I knew better than the pastor and I sat there and second guessed the pastor. I had one pastor as a kid that I got back in contact with many years later as an adult and I sent him a message and I said, I just want to apologize to you for criticizing you as often as I did and sitting in judgment of you as I did. I said, I, I had no business doing that. I I'll never forget it was Brother Harmon. And I was pastoring my first church, and I sent him a message. Or no, I didn't. I called him, now that I think about it. And I called him. Somehow or another, I got his number. I think I got it through Julia. And uh, she and her husband used to go down and visit him in the new church he was pastoring, because he had left the church I grew up in. And he was pastoring in New Jersey. And I called him, and Brother Harmon said to me, Chuck, he said... You never did that. I don't remember you ever doing that. I said, no, because I never did it in front of your face. I did it behind your back. I said, but the word of God said you reap what you sow. I said, and I'm pastoring now, and the last thing in the world I want is to reap what I've sown. I want to repent of it. Amen. I went to him and told him, I'm sorry for having done this to you. Lastly today, and I am closing, I know this message is a little long, but this is an important word from God today. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. Forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is it that you do? What is it that you do? What has God placed on your heart to do? There, you may have one job, you may have dozens. You know, it's, a person can do a lot of little jobs and others can do one big job. You know what I'm saying? But whatever God is, whether God's called you to be a prayer warrior, whether God's called you to be an encourager, whether God's called you uh, to be a, a visitor of the shut-in, whether God's called you uh, to be a, a special singer, whether the Lord's called you today uh, to... Uh, uh, engage in nursing home ministry or prison ministry, whatever the case might be. What is it that you do? And if you are called to do something, if that's your function within the body, then do it consistently and do it well. Because the body can only function well when every member is doing their job, doing its job, and doing it consistently, and doing it well. What is it that you do? Would you stand with me this afternoon?